Hello, and welcome to episode 24 of the Dark Matter Knits podcast. It is January 23rd, 2015, and I'm Elizabeth Green Musselman. And you can find me everywhere online as uh, Dark Matter Knits. And my website is darkmatternits.com, where you can find show notes for this episode. So hi, it's been a couple of weeks since I've seen you. Not a few weeks like last time, but a couple of weeks, which is normal. So I have a few things to talk about today, uh, kind of all on the, or a lot of it, on the theme of branding. I have a yarn review for you today, which is uh, a super fine merino from Cleck Heaton, which is an Australian yarn company. And, uh, and reviewing the yarn kind of got me thinking about, I'm going to do a kind of a straight up review of the yarn, but then I also want to talk about something that the yarn made me think about, which is branding. It's a particularly well branded yarn. And, uh, and it just got me thinking about the way that products are packaged and put together and how that's sort of applicable to the knitting world. So I have a few thoughts to share about that. Um, so a couple of announcement type things before we get started. One of them is that uh, last time we had a giveaway for Andy Smith's Synchronicity collection. This was the two color cable collection that I showed you. And uh, so I've closed that thread and randomly chosen a winner from the people who entered that giveaway. And the winner interestingly was Freckles and Pearls post number 10. And uh, I say that I think that's funny because she actually is the designer for uh, the pesto shawl that I knitted. And she actually gave, uh, gave a copy of the pattern as a giveaway in a previous episode. So it's nice to, nice to be able to give back to her by letting her win a copy of this collection. So congratulations, Allison. <laughs> I will, uh, I will let Andy know that you are the winner and she will place the copy of the collection in your library. And uh, I just wanted to remind you as usual that just because you didn't win doesn't mean you can't have it. <laughs> it's a really great collection and you should go take a look. All of the patterns are available either all together in one group. Uh, it's seven patterns for $18. Or you can, so if you want to make, you know, at least I'd say three of them, which most of you did. A lot of you had trouble choosing which one you would even make first. Um, so if you want to make at least three of them, I would just get the whole collection. Plus it's got all the great tutorials about how to work two color cables. And then the individual patterns are also available. So go check those out. And thank you, Andy, for donating a copy of the collection. I also wanted to let you know, I got, I was contacted by uh, Stacy Dawson of the Mustache Podcast and who is the dyer behind Mustache Yarns and Fiber. And she is actually starting up what she calls the School of Stash. And the idea behind this is that uh, it's going to be kind of like a, a virtual classroom where you learn different techniques and use your stash to, you know, to try out new new ideas. So it's kind of a knit along, kind of a virtual classroom. And she's lined up different teachers uh, to teach you different things and is starting off with a class on socks or a kind of curriculum on socks, I suppose. So let me read you what she said. Um, she says, Mustache U is opening its doors this spring and offering courses in socks education. Yeah. Socks education. Classes begin on March 1st and run through the 31st. I have three designers lined up to act as professors. Megan Williams, who will teach the OMG heel. Jessica Larson, who will teach the afterthought a la carte heel. And Christy Payne, who's going to teach a basic sock with double gusset heel. I am hosting the cowl through my mustache yarn group on Ravelry and requiring all participants use mustache yarn only. I hope I can have another update during February, but I know I have hundreds of skeins out there in the market already. This should be a lot of fun. I'm going to start advertising that enrollment will open on February 15th, so feel free to mention it. Oh, this is no to me. Feel free to mention it anytime during the month of February. <laughs> okay, I'm mentioning in January, but now you know. Um, so feel free to join in on the fun. So I will post, I don't think she has a link up yet, or I don't think she has a, a thread up yet in her group for the School of Stash but I'm sure it will be up soon. So I will put a link to her, to the mustache group 
on Ravelry in my show notes so that you can go check it out. It sounds like a lot of fun. Okay, so the meat of the matter for today. Like I said, I have a, another yarn review for you and uh, a wonderful yarn that is both interesting in its in the actual physical thing and then the story behind it is interesting as well. So the yarn is, let me see what's the best thing to show you first here. It is called Australian Superfine Merino and the producer is Cleckheaton. And as I say, this is a Australian, it's all Australian. So it's uh, the sheep are raised in Australia. It is an Australian um, mill that produces it and a distributor. So a number of things that are interesting about this. Uh, one of them is that this is a, so there's a whole little brochure that I got with the, with the yarn. Um, one of the things to realize about about wools is that there's it's there are not only different breeds of sheep but there are also different even within that breed even within merino you can breed for certain characteristics so you can get softer or lower micron counts or high or you know somewhat rougher or or larger micron counts super fine merino is um there's a little chart in here that shows you Superfine Merino is a particular designation for micron counts of um, 15.6 to 18.5. So it's, it's basically the softest Merino, the finest Merino. And, um, and true to form, this yarn is extremely soft. So this is what it looks like. Here is the, the colorway that's mustard. This is mustard, which they sent me. It's actually a little darker than this. That's better. And then the other colorway that I have is called smoke. So that's this one. And it's a basically a gray with a lot of kind of purpley blue undertones to it. When it's by itself, it looks quite purple. Um, when it's with the yellow, it looks a little more gray. So very, very soft, very smooshy. If you've ever worked with uh, Debbie Bliss's Cashmerino, this is a a lot, this feels a lot like that yarn and works up a lot like it. Uh, I have also, if you've ever worked with Filatura de Crocia's um, Zara yarn, that is actually probably the best equivalent to this. Extremely soft, extremely smooshy. It's that kind of yarn that produces that perfect stitch definition, you know, where you can just see the outline of every single stitch and it just, you just want to put it on immediately. It's lovely stuff. And, um, and basically what they've done is they're working with various, uh, wool breeders in Australia who have sheep that have been bred for this super fine, um, classification. The, um, Let's see. Let's see, look at my notes here to see what else I wanted to to tell you about the backstory here. You know, basically this is the perfect kind of yarn for somebody who likes supporting local products. I mean, I know a lot of people like supporting um, locally produced products from within their own country or within their own region. Um, but this is a, you know, even if you aren't Australian, I think this is a, a good program to support because they are specifically working with farmers who uh, have sustainable grazing programs um, since they utilize grass types that are tailored to regional climactic conditions to optimize fleece growth. So, you know, they're basically taking care of the land as well as the sheep. The, um, the other thing I really like about this is that they, you know, they give you the whole backstory on the mill which is in uh, Wangaratta, which you can actually see here on the, yeah, the Wangaratta Woolen Mills is where it's produced, which is in Victoria. 
And apparently this mill has been around since 1923 and is an important part of the economy in that area. Uh, it says it was built to provide jobs after the First World War and continue to employ many immigrants after the Second World War. To many, it was and still is more than an employer. It's the town's social hub. So, you know, if you know anything about woolen mills, you know that in many places, woolen mills are disappearing. And, uh, you know, so tr you know, trying to keep something like this alive in a place like Australia is, is a pretty big deal. Uh, the team in Wangaratta, it says, transforms the Australian superfine merino wool, which arrives at the mill in a single thread by winding, twisting, reeling, dyeing, backwinding, balling, and packaging the wool into the final Australian Superfine Merino by Kleckheaton product. Um, so, you know, essentially the whole thing is made in Australia. And here's a picture of what that process looks like, as well as the outside of the mill itself. So, a nice story, because it's a, it's a commercial yarn in the sense that it's, you know, we're not talking about an indie dyer. This is, Cleck Heaton is a, a division of patents, or pat, patents, patents, um, but at the same time are supporting local growers. Now, what it was like to, actually, while I'm on the subject of, while I've got the book, I'll talk about working with this in a moment, but I wanted to show you they've got 30 colors. Here's the this one and this one are the ones that I have, but there are 30 other colors. And I think you can see from, from the photograph that they're pretty fashion-forward colors, and a lot of them could be used in men's and boys' garments as well. So a nice, a nice array of colors. And then the patterns are really fashion forward too. Uh, there are a lot of, a number of hats. I really love this the cape, sweater cape as they call it. There are, the, this picture's a little dark in the printing, but there's a lovely men's sweater that has um, a little bit of, of cabling that kind of runs up the sides. I'm not going to show you every, every one, but there's this gorgeous piece that you can obviously do in different variants. It's a raglan. There's a child sweater some really cute Fair Isle, and if they give it, have it in tween sizes as well. Uh, another, actually I like this one even better, a men's shawl collared pullover, a scarf that makes really fun use of the different colors, and that would be very simple to knit and a really elegant and simple long cardigan. And there are others too, but these are, those are kind of the main show pieces. And uh, so yeah, really lovely, lovely designs and you know, really take advantage of the qualities of the yarn. Now, let's see if, if there's anything else. This is an eight ply, so it's essentially um, each, there are, you know, the, what am I trying to say? There are two plies plied together, and then all of those are, each pair is then, there are four pairs that are then plied around each other. So it's a very plump yarn as a result. You can kind of see here. It's got a lot of, a lot of bounce to it. And some of that is from the crimp in the merino, but some of that is just from the ply structure. There are 130 meters in a skein, and each skein is about, uh, what is it, 65 grams. So it's a little bit of an unusual put up, but it comes in, I'll show you, it comes in this kind of, it's in a ball. So not really that unusual, but it's not a skein. So great for, it would be really great for color work, especially for cabling. Uh, perhaps not so much for lace. I think there's a reason why you don't see lace in any of the pieces that I showed you. Um, perfect for just straight up stockinette. 
and um, and ribbing makes a very a very bouncy squishy ribbing what they sent to me was a kit it looks like this it comes in a little nice little project sized bag and it is for this is a, a pattern that's free on their site a very easy beanie two color beanie and it comes with two colors of yarn and I got this combination and I, um, well, the, per the people in my family <laughs> who would wear this hat, this is not a style of hat that looks particularly good on me, um, but the two boys in my family would not wear a pom-pom, so I left the pom-pom off. But I put the giant ribbing on so that it can be folded up. And it used uh, probably about half of the contrast color. I changed it to yellow and about a third, no, sorry, two thirds of the main color or the blue. And it just, you know, it's a real simple, simple hat, simple decreases at the top and just makes a nice, comfortable hat. See, not really my, <laughs> not really my style, but it's, it looks great on, uh, with short hair or on a men's, looks great on man and boys um, so a really nice little simple pattern clear instructions um, it comes on this nice little cardboard card and um, yeah it's a really nice little kit and they actually sent me two one to give away and one for me to try out so I have a second kit that is in let's see what is this sorry about the crinkling folks just this other color. Ah. All right, I'm going to have to open it. I will put it back neatly. All right, so one color is true blue. That's this one. And the other, I think this might be the same. No, this is a different color. The other is dark gray. Lovely. And they look great together. So you can do whatever you want with these, but it also comes with a copy of the hat pattern. And uh, so that will be for giveaway on the site. If you go to my Ravelry group, the Dark Matter Knits group on Ravelry, um, and if you don't haven't joined the group already, if you join the group, you can enter to win there. And I will ask you to, uh, well, I'll figure out what question to ask after I finish recording. So what this was like to work with, uh, absolutely lovely. I think really the, the one thing that you have to adjust to when knitting with a super, super springy yarn like this is that it's almost, it's so springy, it's almost like it has elastic in it. And if you've ever worked with a yarn that's that springy, uh, you almost feel like you're having to adjust your tension a little bit because it, you know, it almost kind of rubber bands on your fingers. And, uh, you know, you feel like you're having to kind of loosen up your tension a little bit just so you're not pulling it too tight. So you might find that you want to go up a needle size, at least, from what you would normally use on a yarn of this weight. This is a, a yarn that typically gets, it's a DK, so it's 22 stitches over four inches Normally I would knit that on a five, and in this case I went up to a six, just because, you know, it, it's got so much bounce that it's actually like I was knitting a little tighter than I normally would. So really nice yarn to work with. I would definitely recommend it. It, um, they actually, I wanted to mention too before I, before we finish this up, that through January 26th, so that's this Monday. So if you're watching this over the weekend, you still have this available to you. Um, you can get a 20% 20 20 off coupon code by emailing the company, and there are directions about how to do that on the website. Um, and I guess they did this in um, as kind of a celebration of the fact that they went to Vogue Knitting Live in New York this past weekend. Uh, so it's kind of an introductory offer on the yarn, so this is a new yarn. 
Um, yeah, so you can use the coupon code as many times as you like, forward it to your friends, etc. So that is very cool. So yeah, lovely, lovely yarn. I definitely recommend working with it if you're looking for something, particularly for, for someone who is very, very picky about how soft their yarn is, or if you're looking for something where you really want the stitches to pop, either for color work or cabling. So thank you uh, to Cleck Heaton and also to Stitchcraft Marketing, um, Stephanie at Stitchcraft Marketing for sending that along to me. I wanted to, like I said, the working with this yarn and kind of looking through the materials that they sent me got me thinking about the issue of branding because there's this yarn is so well packaged that it got me so I was I was knitting along on the hat and thinking, you know, just kind of taking pleasure in how well put together the yarn is and all of its packaging. And while I was knitting, um I was listening to the TED Radio Hour, which is a, if, we've talked about TED Talks before. They're these um, usually about 15, 20 minute talks that you can find online. Uh, they're originally given at, um, in California. And they're on generally about technology, I think it's technology engineering and design is what TED stands for. So they're on some issue within that scope. So the TED Radio Hour is a show on NPR where they kind of pull together several different TED Talks and that are all kind of on the same theme. And they were talking about branding. So I'm knitting away on this yarn and listening to these people talk about marketing and branding. And it was really, really interesting because so much of it applied to what I was working on. And the particular issues that came up that I thought were interesting, one of them was uh, there was a, a fellow named, uh, let me look up his name real quick la, 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 la. his name is oh my goodness Rory Sutherland so he's a uh, a British marketing expert and he was talking about um, the psychology of branding and the way that a well put together product actually increases our pleasure in consuming it. So it's not just the quality of the thing itself, but it's also the way that it is branded and put together that makes makes us happy to use it. So a well-branded product, we actually enjoy more than like all all of the things being equal. If the quality of the thing is the same, the better branded product, we actually take more pleasure in it. And the point he was trying to make, I mean, that's not entirely surprising, but the point he was trying to make was there's nothing wrong with that, right? That this isn't fake pleasure, that this is real pleasure that we're taking in the thing, not just because it's a good thing, because it's a, but also because it's a well-branded thing. And that that's real. You know, that's not just emperor's clothes layered on top of nonsense. He's like, look, you know, if the thing is crap, the thing is crap. Like we will see right through it. But if it's a good product and it has this great branding on top of it, we enjoy it that much more. And nothing could <laughs> be closer to the truth than with this yarn. I mean, look, if, if you look at the label, it's on this, you can see it's on this thick cardstock. And I love the way it's, it's, it actually comes like this in the, in the ball. So this was originally attached to my ball of yarn. And this little thing is also on that thick cardstock. This ribbon, they recommend that you can remove it and um, use it as a tag in your finished piece. Which I don't know that I would ever do that, but you know, nice touch. And, um, and then there are a number of other things about this that, depending on your point of view, might increase your pleasure of the product. So the, the, look, of, the look of this card is very much um, kind of in the style of a late 19th, early 20th century um, product label. And you get this 
you know, kind of, it looks like this has been stamped. It looks like this has been stamped on there. So it kind of gives it this old timey feel and this looks handwritten. It kind of makes you feel like you've gone to a wool market half a century, a century ago and picked up this artisanal yarn, right? This whole thing screams artisanal. And I want to, I want to make clear too, by the way, as I'm saying this, I'm not saying this in a mocking way. Like, um, I mean, you could go all Portlandia critical on the artisanal thing, but, um, but I think, I think actually this is genius. You know, what this does is this increases the pleasure of working with a locally produced yarn. The actual packaging increases the pleasure of it. It reminds you repeatedly of what this is. You know, it's not just a nice soft yarn, but it is Australian superfine merino that in your mind, you imagine that you went and picked up at, hold on, that you were out here with these guys. <laughs> and even better, again, depending on your point of view, with these guys. <laughs> they have several pictures of wool grower, growers and shearers in here, which of course, you know, adds to the mystique of the yarn. Lots of people enjoy the thought of Australian shearers. Do they not? <laughs> so the branding is, is brilliant in that sense. Um, it, it, it makes you feel like you're working with a quality product. This isn't just some, you know, cheaply produced piece. This is actually, you know, a very, a very carefully crafted label. And on top of that, um, another one of the, the videos that I've, I've linked to in the show notes, um, another Ted talk about branding. He talks about how um, a lot of times when people are, when companies and organizations are thinking about the customer experience, they don't actually think about the customer experience. They think about organizationally how to improve things without really thinking about it from the customer's point of view. So the example he gives is of being in a hospital and the hospital's trying to reorganize so that it's more efficient. And he instead looks at, uh, this is Paul Bennett in a talk called Design is in the Details. He instead wants them to focus on what it's like to be a patient in the hospital. And so he has a guy lie there in a hospital bed for hours and hours and hours with a video camera staring at the ceiling to show them like, if you want to see what the hospital looks like to one of your patients, here you go. <laughs> like if you want to think about the, the customer experience, so to speak, here it is. It's not, you know, the organizational structure of the hospital. It's staring at the ceiling. So again, I thought, you know, the, a lot of the, the way that this is put together is really carefully crafted around the customer experience because... Um, for one thing, you know how, I mean, this isn't just true for podcasters, but typically you like to hang on to the tag for your yarn. And, you know, not every yarn, yarn producer can afford to do this, but I'm much more likely to be able to hang on to something like this than I am to, you know, a piece of paper that I have to rip off and that can easily get crumpled up. Um, again, this is very expensive to produce, so I get that. Um, but, you know, it's a... It's cleverly thinking about how the actual knitter or crocheter experiences the yarn. And I also really liked the way that this is tucked in here. It doesn't, this isn't going to snag the yarn. It's just, you know, it just pops right in and out of there. So really nicely, nicely set up. And the fact that it comes in a project bag or, you know, what effectively can become a project bag is also a nice, a nice touch. So just a lot of, um, a lot of nice attention to detail. And, um, I don't know, I guess, you know, since I think a lot about, I do a lot of, you know, graphic design and editing for people in the fiber industry. I think a lot about how we present ourselves to 
other knitters and crocheters and it's just it's interesting to to kind of see how how other people do it so that kind of transitions me into kind of a follow-up from something that came up last time if you remember um, I was talking about the hunting glove pattern that I recently released and um, and that I had gotten kind of a, a mixed response to the photographs that I had put up of the pattern on Ravelry. Um, I got a lot of responses about that. A lot of you wrote to me privately to wanting to kind of express your thoughts on that. And it was really interesting getting your responses. And I thank you for taking the time to do that. Uh, and I want to make clear too, a lot of you were really incensed on my behalf. And I want to make clear that... Uh, I, nobody was rude to me. Um, I just, you know, really the only thing that bothered me about it was that a lot of times people use the disagree and the funny buttons on Ravelry to kind of put people down without actually owning their, their criticism, which can kind of be unpleasant on the other end. So, but that was really the extent of it, which is really not, not a big deal. Um, but I wanted to, I, and I asked for permission in advance, I wanted to share with you a couple of responses that I got that were really interesting and and completely different from each other. Uh, one, one woman in Arizona wrote to me that, uh, she says, I've been knitting for 10 years now and I've knitted many things for many people. Sometimes I only knit once for someone, um, usually someone that doesn't seem to fully appreciate the gift or the time spent on it. So we've you know, we've all encountered that knitworthiness issue before, right? If you love my knitting, I'll keep making things for you. And the person I knit for the most is my friend Al, a hunter. Al loves my knitting. It keeps him warm on hunts or camping trips, and he thanks me each time. I introduced him to the wonders of alpaca and cashmere in a hat made of leftovers. And he shared that for the first time in his life, and he shared that for the first time in his life, he didn't have earaches from the cold. As a hunter and someone who thinks quite a bit about animals and what they provide for us, he says he loves the close to the animal aspect of wearing the wool and alpaca that I knit for him. He's considering raising alpaca, he has other animals, because he says he wants to do his part in this wonderful process. I'll get all the fleece, of course. I spin, too. From Al, I've learned that I have a lot more in common with hunters than I would have ever imagined. Because he hunts, I think he appreciates my spinning and knitting more than any other non-knitter I know. And all this makes me want to keep knitting for him. A true win-win. Needless to say, Al will be getting a pair of hunting gloves. <laughs> so I thought this was really interesting because, uh, you know, essentially she was saying, look, I, you know, I think I support your using those photographs, but her, um, it was more from the perspective of, uh, that are, you know, a kind of responsible approach to hunting and a connection to fiber through knitting can actually be very compatible processes that, you know, basically this guy that she's knit these hats for understands her love of fiber and fiber animals in a way that a lot of other people wouldn't. So I thought that was really fascinating. And then I also heard from a viewer in Australia, apparently we're going to talk about Australia a lot today. <laughs> She says, uh, I just watched your latest podcast and want to add a thought about the flack you copped about your photography of the hunting gloves. Um, as tone can be difficult to ascertain over email, I want to say up front that I don't want to offend you or your family members, and I don't want to stir up a gun control debate, but rather reflect on some of the issues that you raised. And I ended up writing back to her and said, look, I, you didn't offend me at all. Don't worry about that. Did you get any idea about whether the people objecting were not Americans? which I, I don't know. There wasn't any way of telling. I'm Australian, and the idea of hunting for food is foreign where I am. In fact, there is meant to be a duck hunting season each year in my state, but more often than not, it's called off for a number of factors. Number one, Australians have a strong aversion to guns. Number two, the ducks aren't really food. And number three, the environment in which the ducks live is fragile. I very much agree with your father. It's better to know where your meat came from and the conditions in which it was raised. Here in my part of Australia, that is reflected in the amount of information that is available about the provenance of food. This is strongly assisted by the strong regulator government, strong regulator, parentheses, government, that investigates claims about provenance and treatment of animals. 
Finally, on the issue of finding a photograph of a weapon confronting, I would agree. This is likely based on the issues that I have touched on above, with the most influential of these reasons being the very strong gun control laws that we have in my country. While I think you're right to be critical of the very homogeneous styling and photography of knitting patterns, I wonder whether trying to be so different will result in people flagging the picture as inappropriate or not buying the pattern, or whether you're able to tap into a market that feels ostracized and underrepresented. Without trying to be controversial, would you have considered photographing your father with a gun, which is the weapon that certainly springs to mind when you say hunting to me? Um, so that was really interesting, too, because, you know, effectively she's saying that, you know, depending on where you're, where you are and, you know, what culture you've grown up in, your perception of that photograph is going to be very different, certainly. And, you know, definitely the United States has a very different approach to, uh, to, gu to gun ownership and use than many other parts of the world. I definitely recognize that. Um, and so it's, you know, it's definitely one of the things that an ending designer needs to think about is uh, that, you know, it's not just Americans who are looking at these patterns. Um, I think that my response to that would be that um, that the best I can do is to represent where I am and who the people are that I knit for. And to try to do that in a way that helps you understand their, um, what they're really using that knitting for, if that makes sense. You know, that I, I guess I didn't want to show a gun in the picture because I know how much I've lived, I've lived outside the U S for many years. Um, I know, I know how much that imagery can set people off. So I didn't do that for a specific reason. Um, but I think that at the same time, my dad both bow hunts and hunts with guns. Um, I wanted to represent what he really does. And in the description, I talk about the responsible approach that he takes to hunting. And then it's just, and then it's up to you. Uh, yeah, some people are going to be really turned off by it and some people aren't. Um, like, I mean, I think the, this person who wrote in made a very good point that, you know, there's probably going to be both people who are offended by the photography and people who feel like, yes, finally, you know, this represents something that I, that I'm interested in. And that's fine. You know, I, I think almost the worst thing you can do is to try to please everyone. So thank you very much for all of you who wrote in to share your thoughts about this. It's been really interesting conversing with you about it. And, uh, and I really appreciate the thoughtfulness that went into these messages. And if you are ever thinking about writing to me, just know that it is really hard to offend me. <laughs> My general assumption is that people are not jerks. And they're not meaning to be. Um, and you are welcome to disagree with me. I mean, for Pete's sake, I think it's perfectly fine. <laughs> I would hate, hate to think that all of you out there think exactly the same way I do. That would be kind of terrifying. So, yeah. So that's basically what I wanted to talk about this week. I haven't, as far as what I've been knitting, I knit this. And I have been knitting a bunch of stuff that I can't show you yet because, you know, designing and whatnot. So that's what I've been knitting. I haven't been spending it all. I've got to get back to it at some point. And, um, yeah, that's all from me at the moment. I am going to, the last thing I want to show you, because I like to do a technique segment every time, and a number of you have very nicely mentioned how how much you appreciate these designs or technique segments so I definitely want to keep including those each time that I can. I wanted to show you a little trick that I do that uh, is related to yarn overs. So one of the 
And I was thinking about this this week because I'm I'm working on a design that has uh, some lace in it, and so I'm doing yarn overs. Um, and one of the things you may have noticed if you've ever done yarn overs is that sometimes, sometimes they seem to just kind of disappear into the fabric, like the holes just don't, aren't big enough. And the reasons for that can vary. Uh, we've talked before about having a yarn that's too squishy, like this one. The yarn will just fill in those holes for you because it, it just wants to fill up space. So that may be one reason why your yarn overs are disappearing. But um, it's also, you can also pull a yarn over too tight and that may make it disappear. So I wanna show you a little trick that I use to avoid having my yarn overs disappear. So basically what I do is this. When I'm working along, I'm not gonna do a yarn over right at the beginning, obviously, but I'll get a couple of stitches in here. And what I'll do is, when I make a yarn over, like this, I'll actually use this finger to hold that yarn over in place. Just kind of pin the yarn down to the needle. I'm actually pinching it as I work the next stitch. And what that does is it, it basically, it keeps, sorry, it keeps this next stitch from using up all that extra yarn that you used in the yarn over. It keeps it from pulling it too tight and really allows that yarn over to have some space to breathe. So again, what I do is, well, I knit continental, but I'll show you in a minute what it would, might look like if you were knitting another way. So I knit a stitch and then yarn over and basically as I'm, I pinch that in place with my finger, right back here, as I knit the next stitch. And again, it just kind of gives it a little more room to breathe. If you are a thrower, you can do the same thing. You can knit, oh, sorry, yarn over, pinch it here, Actually, this is a little harder to do. I guess I would kind of pinch it with this finger, maybe. A little harder to do if you're a thrower. But pinch it with this finger as I throw. Huh, looks like that really only works for continental. <laughs> but basically you can kind of, um, if you're a thrower, do a yarn over and just kind of hold it hold it down, you're gonna end up with a lot of slack that you can then kind of tighten up a little bit, but it'll leave a nice, um, it just kind of reminds you to keep that yarn over nice and loose. So, that's my little tip for this week. I will uh, be back in a couple of weeks with more fun stuff, and until then, take care, happy knitting. <laughs>